hopefully get started uh, shortly. I'm going to get the go ahead. It looks like my slides are up. Hopefully the speakeasy will work for me. Sometimes it doesn't. And I'm just... Because I want the speakeasy to work, but it doesn't always do it. But that's probably because I fill it with so much text. Uh... Oh, yes. This would be more or less like a prelude and lessons learned type of deal. If you really want to learn how to do gamification, you should uh, head to the workshop we'll be doing tomorrow. So that way you'll be able to go and walk away with a walking gamification model and, you know, being able to do it with your uh, students. Or actually you could do it in higher ed or training as well. Lots of different ways to have this customized to what you want to do with it. All right, no worries. That is the go-ahead. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Sean. Sure. You all are doing well. Um, this is uh, Blue Block or Low Tide to my student sign, Mr. Geo. And today I will be uh, presenting a presentation called It's a Decade of Gamified Learning. And I know that I wish to share with you, but it is working, some lessons that I've learned through um, different researching development of the various different gamification pieces as well as implying, implementing gamified learning within uh, the classroom setting. Um, it has been a mix between middle school and high school. Um, and this was my uh, master's thesis um, way back when I was in Florida. I am here now in Virginia on the East Coast. Uh, we'll be looking at, you know, where it started, where it went, and where do we go from here exactly? Oh, board games, ah, tabletop games. These have changed drastically. And some of the first things we as children learned to play outside of the schoolyard games, such as Tag, Hide and Seek, and Duck, Duck, Goose, these are the building blocks of learning. Utilizing our... I want to click that thing. Uh, uh, utilizing our developing literacy skills and social cues, do we... Learn about such concepts as, you know, rules, fairness, competition, winning and losing. These may seem small, but these early steps into games carry on with us for the rest of our lives. The board games of Clue and Monopoly force us to use our critical thinking skills to deduce the mystery of the whodunit at large. Monopoly, well, to be successful, you must be willing to compromise, bargain, and cooperatively play to claim all the properties on the board. Tabletop games are a wondrous exploration of creative problem solving that you can't find anywhere else outside of world problems in math or challenges in the workplace or your community. These games have the uh, ability to make us strategize and develop the skills that we need to be a functional and, well, productive member of society. At least that's what I've been told. Well, we're moving on to computer games that 
well, they've evolved. Computer games emerged and removed the need to set up boards and keep track of pieces. The board program did it for you. You brought it with new sets of challenges and new ways to blend and mix learning styles. At the surface, computer games, well, I'm sure you have absorbed not just pure computer games, but educational computer games delighted in bright imagery to tell their story. But in ways that were not seen in board games or tabletop games. If we did things wrong in the board games or the tabletop games, we could get away with it. You could smudge the results at times, so even allow us to create our own rules. The house rules, if you will. Like, what do you even do with free parking anyway? Every person I have to have asked has a different use for it. <laughs> Computer games were fairly rigid and forced you to use their rules, unless you knew how to code and mod it. These set rules maintain learning to a development to a certain whether by sequence of events or correct answers. There were very little in the way of a student player could change the predetermined outcome. They allowed the maths and the sciences to flourish. Magic School Bus was wildly imaginative, yet were able to teach whole units, if not whole courses, in its, its own individualized programs. Most notably, the solar system and geology ones gave you a chance to explore the whole solar system, or well, ours at least, and its planets, whereas the geology had you investigate mystery rocks and perform lab tests to determine what kind of rock, mineral, and gemstone you had found. You may have encountered Bill Nye with his trademark ways of learning, exciting all those who see him, and never bored with his music, fun facts, and a well-crafted array of segments to get the topics across. Although older computer programs of note, on the slide you can see all Terratopia, the clue finders, and where in time is Common San Diego. I don't know if we'll ever be able to catch all. Even at the bottom uh, right-hand corner, we see that new old computer games, though more accessible through smartphones and tablet devices, we see ABC Mouse, Adapted Minds, Math Monsters, Prodigy, Adventure Academy, and a Night Zookeeper, and so many more. Clearly, a path for learning in games can be seen. Common features among all the games is a character profile for customization, the usage of semiotic agents, weaving together a story with branching paths, and not focus on a singular plotline, whilst encouraging cross-curricular content. And with STEM content, they've added art, world history, green education, musical cues, hint givers, whenever you got stuck, and design framework for the user interface. Uh, I didn't say it had to be good U UI or UX design, but it is there to an extent, and critical on creative thinking. For me to do this slide any real justice, I could give an hour-long presentation on this topic alone. The way video games have evolved into its art form and extension of the human experience through gameplay. Ludology and its story, narratology, remember these terms will pop up again later, but video games bridge the, the glaring gap between board and tabletop gaming and computer games, making it a far more interactive and play student-led experience. Not just through their graphics and technological systems have made leaps and bounds since the 80s. Again, I could do a whole presentation, if not dedicated a year-long discourse to video game history and the making of such things. But these video games can take us out of our world and into theirs. And that is probably more self-evident with games featuring an open-world, sandbox kind of world. Kind of like the one we're currently in. Second Life, Minecraft, and the newer virtual worlds like Meta, 
OpenSim, and VRChat. The bottom left is a uh, the same character, Laura Craft, through all of her incarnations. You can see we started very polygram and pixelated, and as technology, as systems got better, um, the technology got better to make more realistic facial shapes and not just kind of blocky textures, giving things assignments like eyes, noses, and lips um, to make them more specific so that people could tell what type of character is that. Thanks for asking questions. I don't mind stopping to answer those. Yep, if you have a question, don't uh, hesitate to ask. These thrust us into a world of imagination to learn social cues from others, give us a world of knowledge and experience at our fingertips and immerse ourselves and our students to focus and engage on what is before them. To play and explore their content and then to reach the top of that Maslow's hierarchy to create something of their own in science, technology, engineering, math, STEM, and career and technical education, CTE education. We teach by doing and give them various ways through project-based learning to apply what they've learned and to do something with that knowledge. It is this quote that stands that defines what we do from other, others with 300 years ago. Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I may remember. Involve me and I learn. That was by Benjamin Franklin. And almost 3,000 years ago. Well, the things that we have to learn before we can do them, we learn by doing them, by Aristotle in ancient Greece. These types of explorations into what constitutes learning has always been coming down to games, performing, actually doing them, having a walking knowledge of them. Our ancestors knew that for the young to learn and be successful, we've had then play games to gain essential skills and knowledge to live a productive life. Tossing, throwing, and target games to improve their accuracy with a spear or a bow. Tag and hide and seek to improve our agility and to hide from predators. And now we carry on that legacy with gamified learning. Education is changing. Allow that to sink in. Education is changing, and it really is. I know at times it seems like it isn't, but looking back at a mere 10 years, do we see some drastic changes? Some good, some bad, but the important point is that change is happening. We need to recognize this for what it is. We've become blinded sometimes by progress and success that it can be hard to see or even remember all the things that have changed because sometimes they happen so seamlessly that we often don't even notice how different it is. But we've adapted and adopted newer methods out of ease or convenience. Take autosave and cloud saving. I hardly ever have to carry around a floppy disk or a USB drive anymore since all of my files sync online on the cloud. And all I do is I log in, and poof, it's all there, and I can continue working. Like, really, how amazing is that? We need to know that education is at a crossroads of some major changes, and decisions will need to be made on whether or not it will sink or swim. Yet surrounding it all, the student, the recipient of this education, of the teaching and the hope of learning, how can we be making such major decisions without including the student voice on the table? Aren't they stakeholders in their own education? More often than not, we exclude young people in the conversation just because they haven't lived long enough to have the life experiences, or perhaps their voice is ignored as it belongs that it may appear to lack wisdom, or a common action that happens is that education is, quote-unquote, slow to change. It is, I'm sort we can all agree on this, at least at the public K-12 sector. 
But, in spite of all of this, students just want their voice to be heard. If we don't answer their call, we lose them. Them, as they become disenfranchised, and they, the desire to learn goes along with it. Oh, Beth, I know you don't mean that. How can we say we know what's best when we can't even agree on whether or not we can change age-old pillows of the traditional school model, such as assigning letter grades, the role of ISS and OSS versus responsive behavioral management, and some, so many other areas that seem to be locked in place and frozen, since the adults can't seem to agree? I know, in this fast-paging uh, technological world, it seems the younger you are, the kind of more prone you are to change and to find a quick change or a quick help to help you out. Right, Jade? But education is changing. Maybe not as a whole, but individual teachers are making a difference. It's true. And we do this for our students. We've recognized that the normal way of doing things isn't cutting it anymore. And if you take anything away from this presentation in this, that, well, change can happen. It may be small at first, but it grows, like ripples in a pond. To change is hard. To go against the grain is even harder. To let go of the old ways to build a bridge that forms between our present to our future is the hardest of all. It is often at first a very lonely world. A salmon trying to go upstream. You a teacher of change versus the dogma of education and professors of traditional methods telling you it won't work. It's too crazy an idea. Why are you putting all that extra work on yourself? Yes, to change is to work a bit extra. But for our students, we try many things, even if others are skeptics. But in time, we pass on this knowledge, and that you will find that those akin to your willingness to change are there. You just got to know where to seek them out. It is here we build small communities that grow in time, planting the seeds and attracting those that see the change that you're doing and, well, it makes them excited. They see the old ways and can now see a new way to do things. It is often exhilarating. Every image I use, and I am a very highly visual person if anybody asks you, I use with purpose. Every video, resource, book and white paper I've read with purpose and an open mind to see how can I incorporate this into my teaching. You kind of change yourself to see these things differently and from a different perspective it can grant you into greater insight that you may have never known before. <laughs> I'm sure you do, Thunder. This image in particular is from an excursion from the Metagame Book Club. That was run by K. Novak and Abacus Capellini, with what seems like ages ago. The exact date of this image is April 14th, 2013, almost 10 years ago today. With adventures of this cognitive dissidence guild in World of Warcraft, when Mists of Pandaria was first released, exploring ways we could use WoW and programs like it to teach our students, who would dare think that games like this would provide some kind of educational value. But we did. This scene takes place at the end of the introduction to the mists of Pandaria when you first start out as a Pandaren character on the Wandering Isle. I won't spoil it for you, but this forest holds memories. It ties the story together with the mane of Azeroth and plucks at the hot stream like you wouldn't believe. Imagine that, tying learning new game mechanics with social-emotional learning. It wasn't a buzzword ten years ago. 
But it was even here that story and social emotional intelligence played a role. Oh, wow, I would have loved that to have gone to that conference. Uh, I love you. I love. I can. I can never decide which one I'm going into. Sometimes I have too many. Too many games on my plate. <laughs> Even in a massively open online role-playing game or MMO RPG, for sure. For some of you who don't know that, here is a link to a slideshow that talked about this um, from way back when. Uh, But it was here that we found each other. A community found that grows. CTE is often fairly lonely with few teachers in the same school considered CTE and then those same teachers are most likely teaching very different courses with different competencies and such. I yearned for what my school could not give me at the time, a place where changes in education were happening. And so this brings exploration into online communities. I tried social medias, the Facebooks, and various forums. Oh, I know, right? Oh, you're in there. <laughs> but the educational communities on Second Life will be on what one expected. Such groups as ST and Visti that will an influx of new ideas, speakers, and experiences. Scary at first. You never know unless you try. And trying is half the battle. Doing something that seems crazy or not the norm, sitting around on sculpted couch things and attending a meeting in a virtual world, my friend said I was nuts. This picture was the first ever planning meeting I ever attended. This is dated May 14th, 2013. I was still new to Second Life and I hardly knew anyone, but I knew what I was looking for. An open room and open minds that considered to not be complacent, to not let things remain as they were, but they were actively changing what they wanted to see happen in education, and I was happy to be a part of it. Though these educational groups had high tides and low tides of members, and varying degrees of complacency, it worked for the most part. I mean, consistency, my apologies. Varying degrees of consistency. It worked for the most part. It created a place to exchange ideas and to not be seen as the only person in the room with wild and weird ideas. Practically everyone in the group had wild and crazy ideas to change education. Teaching with Minecraft, someone writing a book that pointed out the ugly truths and flaws of public education, using social media to promote literacy. These things seem commonplace now, but... Back in the day, these ideas were looked over, avoided, and thought too crazy to do. How could you possibly regulate such things in the classroom? <laughs> Yet, most of these ideas bore fruition, and some still do. Oh, wow, well, there's the book right there. I'm sure that's the one you're thinking of. <laughs> Oh, thank you. That means a lot to me. But I will say, what is impossible can be possible. The emergence of new technology can often bring forth new imaginings of possible scenarios of the future. That's just a fancy way of saying how what was once science fiction can one day happen in the future. Isn't that just crazy and amazing to think about at the same time? Video calls, automatic doors, spacecrafts, all conceived as science fiction when they first came out. But now these things exist in our lives. 
Various online educational groups explored that with book clubs. Uh, this picture in the, mid in the middle, towards the bottom, is dated July 11th, 2016, where we recreated one of the settings in the book of Ernest Cline's Ready Player One, which, in the span of a little over 10 years, was once a book published in 2011, and then a theatrical movie released in 2018. Yes, H's Basement. Both following the similar premise of a teen who goes on an epic virtual reality f adventure finding the Easter eggs of James Holiday, the creator of a virtual reality system known as Oasis. Which, that's funny enough, it's where we all. Oh, hmm. amazing how things work out. Real government, business, and yes, even public schools have migrate, had immigrate, yeah. Yes, had immigrated to using these virtual world platforms to do work, trade, and commerce. And yes, to all you librarians out there about to say, the book is way better than the movie, here too. Yes, it is true. In the book, public school takes place on a virtual reality world known as Ludus. Well, it was all about the 80s back then. Those enrolled in public school received a generic virtual reality headset, VR, VR gloves, and internet, which is considered a public utility in the book. You have classes online with a teacher who's also wearing a VR headset, and your classmates, which may not all live in the same area as you do, but have been groups and sorted with students. Taking an aptitude-like test to determine their chemistry. Speaking of chemistry, in the book, a VR public school lesson was the dissection of a virtual frog myology, a viewing of the Big Bang Theory of the creation of stars and planets for astronomy. They ha even had a lesson involving students changing their avatars to play out parts in Romeo and Juliet, and then solving mathematical equations and computer logic problems on a virtual whiteboard. Some of these ideas seem rather far-fetched back in the 2010s. Here we are, in the 2020s. These ideas and concepts seem closer than ever, and yes, I highly recommend reading the book. Before you go watch the movie. And I might suggest the audiobook for it, because they have Will Wheaton as the narrator, which is too cool. There's a little link for you. Oops. No. Alright, I did do the correct thing. My apologies. Games and players come in all shapes and sizes. Gamification in education can be as small or as big as you want to make it. From merely using the Jeopardy review games to something like Eraser Slide, where a student is selected to slide an eraser down the board, where goals are indicated, where the students can have half homework, odds or events, or the slim chance of no homework at all. It gives a chance for students to have any say in their learning, um, to compete, and make it fun at the same time. Or, you can do it as big as a custom Dungeons & Dragons-esque campaign, spanning the whole course with quest boards, as assignments, final project building challenges, and, well, epic boss battles. And equipment buying with management and resources. They say the work of children is play, and I tend to agree that children learn best when they don't think they're learning at all. But, well, they are. But on a more serious note, for this particular slide, I must say. Oh no, it got truscated. I have to find the rest of this one. Diversity and inclusivity walk hand in hand. To establish these terms, diversity refers to the range of differences that exist among individuals, including differences in cultural, race, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status, religion, and more. In education, diversity can enrich the learning experience by providing a range of perspectives and experiences that can broaden students' understanding of the world. Inclusivity, on the other hand, refers to the extent to which individuals feel valued, respected, and included in the educational environment. Oh, very true, Beth. Very true. 
an inclusive environment recognizes and supports diversity and seeks to create a space where all students feel welcomed and empowered to participate in learning. Together, diversity and inclusivity create a positive learning environment that is supportive of all students, regardless of their background or individual characteristics. In an inclusive and diverse classroom, students can learn from one another and gain a deeper understanding of the world behind world around them. This is the thing that got cut off. I almost made that uh, 255 word count there. <laughs> oh, wow. Diversity and inclusivity are increasingly being recognized as important considerations in video games and tabletop games like Dungeons and Dragons. In games, there will have been a growing movement to promote diversity uh, and, inclus and, bleh, and inclusivity in game design with efforts to include some more diverse characters, stories, and settings. This includes representation of people of different races, gender, sexual orientations, and abilities, as well as efforts to combat harmful stereotypes and tropes. For example, game developers may include character customization options that allow players to create avatars that represent themselves or a wider range of identities. For example, game developers may include game co hmm. I apologize, I just read that. Represent themselves or a wider range of identities. I'm certain Zinnia Zobo would agree as the original speaker on identity and virtual roles. You should see one of her many presentations on the subject, available on the VWP YouTube channel in the past conference streams. Just a little plug there. But in tabletop games like Dungeons and Dragons, diversity and inclusivity can be promoted through game design and storytelling. Game designers may create settings that are inclusive and represent a diverse range of cultures and peoples, and may include character options that allow players to play characters with different abilities, genders, races, and backgrounds. Storytelling can also be used to promote inclusivity and diversity by highlighting the experience of marginalized groups and challenging harmful stereotypes. Uh-oh. Goodness gracious. Speak easy. Don't do this to me. Storytelling can also be used to promote inclusivity and diversity by highlighting the experiences of marginalized groups of challenging harmful stereotypes. Ultimately, promoting diversity and inclusivity in video games and tabletop games like Dungeons and Dragons can help create a more welcoming and inclusive gaming culture that reflects the diversity of players and the wider world. But, you know, not everything is going to fit into the final draft, and that's okay. If we're getting a master's thesis or a doctoral thesis, you know not everything is going to go in there, as much as you want it to. So, expect the unexpected, as I always say. It's true. It's my senior class quote from Once Upon a Time Ago. When I first... Speak easy, what are you doing? When I first started teaching, I told myself everything had to be perfect. And this often resulted, yes, with more polished looking final result. But me not leaving school by 6 or 7 or even 9.30 p.m. I got very, um, chumsy with our janitor. He always waited for my room to clean it last because he knew I'd be in there doing stuff. I know that now, Beth. My high school lets out around 2 p.m., so yeah, I stayed late. In college, I was always running the midnight oil, sometimes the candle, both ends. Working to make things look nice and amazing, and for the most part, yeah, it did look awesome, and students were rather floored at times. But I can say I've dialed things back, and I try and avoid staying past 6 p.m., if I can help it. Not just on working to create materials for teaching, but grading, lab preparation, and setting up materials I need in advance really does help smooth things over. Sure, I can make things all digital and save myself some of the trouble, but project-based learning benefits greatly from the added hands-on approach for students to not only show me they've, that they've learned, but also applied what they've learned. Yes, Thunder, it's true.
I speak easy hard is like lagging. I'm so sorry, y'all. Is it working for you all? Oh, it keeps like double putting my text. It looks okay. Alrighty, thanks. I tried to shoehorn good content in all limited time and it fit the area that we were in very well. It was just too much and students became overwhelmed. I had to acknowledge that I had done too much and I need to pace myself a bit better. So not just fitting everything, but being mindful about the time, how long it will take you to make the assignment, and then how long it will take for students to do it. Uh, yes, well, I wish somebody told me that <laughs> as a first duty, Joel. Good piece of advice. And the workload, where schedules were changing, or any upcoming holidays, things like that can really take your students' focus um, away from class, which I'm sure people knew that already. But in real life, it's easy to think about how players are people, even at the end of the game. In real life, it's easy to think about how celebrity people might look like their lives are perfect, picture, picture perfect. But beneath the surface, we can find that they are all real people, just like you or me. The top photo of the internet celebrity, Felicia Day, who published a biography and even in a couple of interviewing podcasts about her rise in internet fame, told of how she suffered from negative body image, food eating disorder, and depression. Some of the newer folks of Vox Machina suffered from depression, agoraphobia, dyslexia, and a debil debilitating fear of heights. Sometimes we forget to see that people are also real people, or that the player is also a real person. Beneath that armor, the exotic fantasy race, or some pointed ears, there's a person with feelings, and someone who could be their own worst critic. Ah, uh, true, Beth. Or for a female student of mine who took everything they had to come and just sit at the table to roll some dice, because... Socializing isn't really her thing, but they were willing to give it a try. In a game where you could be someone else, it can offer you a bit of a place to save your face or act in a way that you wouldn't normally. You are with your friends or possibly in a class that you know no one at all. In this game, you can be someone else. And this is alright. As teachers, sometimes it can be hard to realize that they aren't just your students. They are Several other teacher students. Possibly an athlete, maybe a chess player, Girl Scout. They too have different things going on in their lives that might make it difficult to give them to give their one hundred percent of themselves into the class. At the high school level, this is even harder, as most older students or older siblings are taking care of their younger siblings, and they might even be working part time. Oh, stressing about exams, SATs, college admissions, and life after high school. It is a lot. But in the game, they can get a moment's reprieve and not be themselves. Because being a kobold thief, you want to focus on getting all the best loot and discovering all the secrets. In the top right corner is the cover for the 2014 April issue of Virtual Education Journal, Veg, which is now defunct. But their archive still exists online at issue. The link is provided there. But the future. I know. I'm sorry to bring up all the things from the past, but they seemed a bit relevant. Well, the future for me will, will kind of look like this. Someone was looking at a lot of balancing issues for the first set of classes um, for players to choose from. They don't stack up so well against some of the newer classes. Um, so pacing can also be improved. We have moved to a 4 by 4 schedule, so my year-long class has been cut in half. And so adjusting that has been a bit of a challenge but one that will serve to only make the game better for my future students. But apart from that, it will be to organize the resources a bit better and clean them up. Creating some more shops. Lots of students have been enjoying the shopping experience in our D&D light. 
So just improvements mostly to the quality of life for my students and to make the gameplay a bit smoother. But what's this? A mysterious fog rolls in. Ah, Shogun Toboy Banzai. Thank the gods I found you. This reflection has come to its end, and our attentions are needed elsewhere. This was just a prelude. I do hope the lessons and resources you find here will help you on your journey to be the best educator that you can be. Now we must rendezvous to the ruins at Workshop B tomorrow, as we will kick things into high gear at 11.20 a.m. or 11.30. And we do hope that you'll come. He senses a great danger, a great longing, and within you, perchance, your own destiny that can be found within Atrial. A world of fantasy and whimsy, where the brave of heart and keen of vision will find the treasure in its land. But please say you'll come, and I have something that you should be cheering up you. Yes, of course this is to be continued. <laughs> Speak easy, why? He does fade back into the fog, though. Now, will you rise to the challenge? Do you have any questions for me? Ah, oh, thank you, Beth. I know there's a, a lot in there, and there was a few more that found themselves on the cutting board, because it was just too hard for me to put them on there. In an emotional way. I think uh, nobody wants to hear about other things that made things more complicated. Um, I think I did that la enough crying from last uh, my last presentation. From last. There's that. <laughs> oh, you are most welcome. Thank you for coming. Oh, yes, I can. I can totally do that for you. I think I was being a bit uh overly cautious because last time I presented, I was like a little over my time frame. So I wanted to, you know, make sure I had time for everything. But no, thank you all so much for coming. Again, if you are wanting and willing, uh, workshop is tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. We will be having... Lots of fun producing gamified artifacts and giving you a chance to really make something and bring it into your room, whether you're a teacher, whether you're an educator, being able to explore this in a way that is going to be hands-on. Um, get ready to learn and make some very fun and, and things, definitely. Ooh, that's a great question. I have worked with uh, neurodiverse students. And I will say when I when we're doing the gamified learning, it I've had such a great response from students because they really kind of know what's going on. They don't know specifically like what file for IOP IEP plan they have, but they've actually been very kind and considerate. Um, most of my work tends to be group work, um, so they um, in their sequel bands or their parties, um, they take on different roles. Someone might be a leader. Someone will be a content creator. Someone will be a communications export, making sure everyone is staying on task and um, getting all the emails and connecting all the data together. Um, someone will be on research and, you know, someone will be an assistant to somebody else. So it is a great way that I find with neurodiverse students to have groups where you have such a different range of people in it. I think I have been very fortunate to have students that have been um, very gung-ho about what we've been doing. Um, at the high school level, being able for them to get a chance to really kind of see what it is first before they make a decision. Because I do not force D&D &D on people. It is not something that you can do. Because if you do that, they're not going to, people won't like that. So I give kind of a like, this is what gamification is. So we spend a whole week doing gamified learning stations. And they experience the different paths of gamified learning. Which kind of ties into, you know, getting to know people. This is like one of your uh, first you know, your first couple of two week, two or three weeks where you want to spend time with your class, them getting comfortable with each other so they can learn from each other and, you know, be in a place and a space that they know that, you know, they can talk and not be, like, hushed or how dare you talk about these things because you shouldn't be able to do that. 
Um, it's giving them a chance to have that positive learning environment, really stressing that, you know, this is a safe space and that all ideas are good idea. Um, well, at least especially in the brainstorming phase. So having other students work together of different um, A, Bs, and C students, um, having them work together in a group really does help um, bring about the people that are all suffering from um, intellectual deficiencies, if you will. I, I'm not 100% of the correct political correct at home, but with our not neurodiversity, it is a, a luckily a challenge that I haven't had to overly face, but I know that is for other teachers. It may be more difficult in other classes, but not in my own. Oh, well, pay, taking out usually the D&D &D campaign for well, how I do it, it runs the whole school year. Now, on a full by full learning program, it's really different in the case that it is now my year long class has been turned into a semester. So being able to condense things, usually on a year long class, we spend a whole uh, nine weeks in one area. Then there's a end of a uh, quarter project. That leads them to a boss fight. That leads them into the next area. So the next area becomes the next portal. And I usually can do four quarters, four areas in gamified learning for a year-long class. In the semester, I've been about able to do three in a semester. But what that means is that instead of spending three and a half weeks in an area, I might spend only two and a half. Two and a half, and then it goes to a building challenge. Oh, not at all, uh, Thunder. You do not have to be a gamer to apply gamification in the classroom. It's just a way to kind of help with that motivation, not, well, the lack of uh, motivation, and bring in the engagement back into the room. Because um, there's lots of different types of games. It doesn't have to be D&D &D or Uno or Monopoly. or you, It can be as simple as, again, that Jeopardy review game, um, Slide the Eraser. So there are other versions of it. There's like Shoot the Hoops. Um, where uh, people are given, I think it's like note cards that they write on it, and that if you fold it a certain way, they made like an origami ball, and they shoot the hoop into um, a the bin for collection. And if you do that, like uh, I don't remember if that particular teacher did extra credit, or it they it allowed them to earn something for doing it, or making a basket of sorts. So again, it. Um, it varies on how you want to do gamification for your specific rooms. Oh yeah, there's. Uh, I'm gonna share, be sharing a bunch of uh, playlists from YouTube um, with different teachers trying different things um, because, like I said, gamification it can be as small and easy, or maybe something that's big or complex. It depends on what you want. Um, some of my earliest works were looking at um, like Jurassic Park. For DNA sequencing. So it was you walking at Jurassic Park and they were doing biology, learning about animal and plant cells and stuff like that. But it was all looking at the biologies of ancient world prehistoric plants and dinosaurs, comparing DNA samples, learning the differences on classifications of those autumns and species and phylum and kingdoms. Um, another one um, was a more fantasy DNA. Um, one where it looked like bre uh, with dragons. Um, and so that was actually done on a website. And then we had uh, these uh, cool uh, kind of worksheets. And a, there was a group project at the end presenting their final dragon. And what was the desired trait that they were trying to breed. And they had to show utilizing the Punnett squares and the DNC, DNA codes that were provided on the site to show how they would do that ladder and the um, the family tree type of thing. Um, there's definitely a lot of great resources out there. People recognize that these things are, it's not much, a, I, I know like the term is carrot on a stick, chocolate covered broccoli. I know that's something that we've talked about at uh, the Metagames Book Club. But um, when it really just comes down to it, like this is just another thing in a toolbox for a teacher to use. It's not something that um, you have to use it. I'm not saying you have to. It depends on the teacher. It depends on the classroom environment if you have people that are very, you know, uproariously um, intense. Uh, maybe they just leave. Maybe they just sleep in your class. Whatever is happening, you know, it, it has to work for the class. If it doesn't work for the class, you can't, you can't force it.
it, it's got to be a sort of chemistry there. All right. Well, at the 50 mark, yes. If you have any questions more, you can IM me or come to our session. I will be will be walking and answering and walking pretty much one on one with you guys. I'll have lots of different posters and things out, um, so you can see. Um, be four other presentations that talk about this topic, so there will be in little slideshows that you can take and peruse at um, your uh, leisure. But thank you all so much for coming. Have a great rest of your uh, conference day. I do not want you to get uh, late to your next uh, session, so check out the schedule and see what's